and welcome back to the Firearms Nation podcast. Here we are yet again doing a live stream podcast. I got to tell you, I, I love doing this. I think it adds a, a whole other level of excitement to these interviews because they are live and the fact that people can interact with it makes it even better. But we're still getting the podcast portion, which is as always, uh, in-depth interview with somebody in the firearms world or firearms nation, however you want to call it. Uh, so if you are just joining this channel for the first time, if you're a guest um, and you're on the video, please uh, subscribe to the channel. So you'll be getting all the updates as they come about. I'm going to probably redo this as a podcast at some point. And you like to watch the videos, that's great. But if not, you could always listen on the Firearms Nation podcast on any uh, podcast app that you use. I'm on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Podcast Addict, Google Pod, all of them. I got it covered. So you'll, you'll get this firearms content. And uh, I enjoy doing this all the time. So I appreciate any review that you leave. Uh, I take it to heart, especially if it's a five-star review. That always makes me feel better. But anyways, I digress. Tonight... I got a special guest, uh, fellow law enforcement officer. I always enjoy talking to people who are in the tactical world. Uh, and he's got quite the background, but who are also competitive shooters. If you follow the show at all, you know how much uh, I've talked about that, how important competition is. It's just like, you know, you, you think about martial arts. Uh, you can do all the independent practice of the martial art you want, but until you pressure tested against another person, you're never going to know. And that's that what competition is. Obviously, you know, gunfights are real pressure tested, but you can't go out and get into a gunfight all the time, but you can go out and compete all the time. So I'm sure we're going to get into this with my guest tonight, who is Matthew Little, who is Greybeard Actual. Uh, and we'll talk about that moniker, what that means. Uh, but he is a special forces veteran. He is a former law enforcement officer with Chicago PD, uh, SWAT officer, and he's also a master class shooter in all the disciplines of shooting. Uh, maybe not NRI bullseye, but we'll, we'll find out. And uh, But more importantly, he's written a book, and we're going to talk about that book, and it's a book about training. So let me bring him on. Matt, thank you so much for uh, coming on the Firearms Nation podcast. Well, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. I've been uh, looking forward to talking to you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that myself. Uh, so we got a lot to break down tonight. Um, let's start with your special forces. What what made you want to go into the military? And specifically, how did you end up in special forces? So what actually kind of started the whole journey for me and I do come from a military family. Um, my dad was a fighter pilot, and then he was a federal agent after that. And my 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 grandfather actually served in World War II, so and then did some law enforcement as well. So I come from that background, but really for me, kind of the driving impetus as to what I did in my career came from martial arts. I started doing martial arts when I was really young, and I develop this whole like fascination with kind of the, the warrior ideal, right? You know, kind of that self-perfection through, through strife and, and through managing the chaos. And it just seemed like the logical modern day equivalent of the people I admired in history. So I wanted to give it a shot. And, uh, and, and how I got to tell you, go ahead. Sorry. I got to tell you, I'm, I'm really, I'm really fortunate that I was able to do it because it was, it was hard getting there, but it was like the entry ticket into a world that a lot of people only see in books and movies. You know, it was like, I got to be with people that were the equivalent of the heroes from the Iliad by Homer, or, you know, the Knights of the Round Table with King Arthur, right? Like those people really exist. And I got to work alongside them. And that was, you can't, you can't replace that. Okay, that's interesting that you, you brought that up. Uh, were, was that your expectation going into uh, the military? It was what I was hoping for. Yeah, it really was. That was kind of what I was seeking out. So you, you said your dad was a, a fighter pilot. You didn't want to go that route. 
Um, so I'm 6'3", and cockpits are kind of small. <laughs> but honestly, that wasn't really the driving force behind the decision. It, it really was that I wanted to, I wanted to test myself in kind of a different way from what he did. And I really respect what he did. He was very accomplished at it. But that really wasn't the path. I wanted to take a more, more hands-on approach, I guess. It's the best way to put it. All right. And why special forces particular and, and not a tanker or helicopter pilot or something like that? Because the things I had seen and read about, you know, SF and Vietnam, right? What really struck me about it was kind of the, the well-rounded Renaissance man aspect of it. I mean, you had to be a teacher, you had to be well-versed in all these different disciplines, at least competent in them. You had to be physically and mentally ready for a wide variety of challenges. And it just seemed like, it just seemed like the right choice for me. Okay. And going the SF route, you're exposed to a lot of different things. What do you think was the more challenging aspect of getting into special forces? Um, honestly, it was learning as a young man because there's always bureaucratic nonsense, no matter what you're doing. Right. Sure. And, nothing is ever as pure from the inside as it appears from outside. And there's a certain amount of nonsense you have to put up with to get to where you want to be. And to be honest, as a young man, that was probably the hardest part for me was developing the discipline in myself to realize that I had to do some things that were going to be objectively, perhaps not the most intelligent things in the world, because it's the bureaucracy, it's the institution, but you have to get through those to get to where you want to be. And that was a hard lesson for me at first. Like when I first joined the army as a private, I really struggled with that. Right. I really did. And then once I went to selection, I kind of made up my mind that I was going to do whatever it took to get there so that I could see if it was going to be what I was hoping for on the other side. And a lot of the process of getting there wasn't what you would expect. But when I got there, I got everything I was looking for. So that was not only probably the most challenging thing for me, but the biggest lesson I learned from it. And the thing that helped me throughout the rest of my life, honestly, which is learning that you have to, you have to put up with a certain amount of BS to get to where you want to be. But that if you really want to be there, it's probably worth it. Okay. I like that. That can actually be the title of this podcast. Um, we, you served, during what time frame? So I joined the army as a young man at 18, right? And it was pretty much a peacetime army. Um, then I went to selection in the 90s, and there was still not a whole lot going on, right? Mogadishu had just happened. Um, I had missed it because I was in the pipeline for 20th group. Um, and I made a choice, right? When I got through with selection in the Q course, I had a choice where I could stay on active duty or I could go into law enforcement, which I'd done briefly in between being on active duty before while I was in the pipeline through the National Guard in the Green Beret. And since SOF was pretty much across, you know, army wide, pretty much benched for a while after Mogadishu, I decided to go be a cop in like the biggest, most crime ridden city I could find. So I went to Chicago and I stayed in 20th group and it actually, it was a really good deal for me. And I joke about this a lot, right? That it basically I looked into the perfect arrangement for me because I loved being the police and I loved being in special forces and I got to do both. And the really good thing about it is like I said, everything's got its bureaucratic nonsense, right? Everything has its, particular brand of stupid you have to deal with. But it's a bit of a different flavor between the police and the military worlds. So what I got to do is I got to bounce back and forth between the two. Whenever I would get really aggravated with one, I could go to the other one for a while. So my big joke is that um, I got over. I did half each of two careers and I got two full pensions. Okay. But it, it, it really was, it was a great, a great deal for me for my nature, for my personality, because I was able to do both 
and able to explore both. And they both kind of fed into each other and helped each other out. And it just, it worked out really well for me. So you, you go to Chicago and that's where I'm from. So, uh, God bless you for doing that. Although, uh, it's different back then than it is now. I mean, different, I mean, look, crime is still crime, but I think back then police still had more support than they do right now. I mean, right now cops are leaving in, in, in troves in Chicago and retiring early. And I know they had six suicides in one year, which is crazy amount. Regardless, you start out as a rookie in Chicago, but you're already in SF at that point. Yeah, I was already a Green Beret at that point. Right, so, how hard was it to have to go through? Because I'd been through the the silliness of the academy and all the the, the crazy stuff they they try and teach you. How, how hard was it to to sit through all that? And did they know your background when you were going through? They did. Um, they knew my background. I'm not sure. Somebody in personnel must have told them off of my application packet because they already knew by the time I got to the academy. It it wasn't bad for me specifically because of the lesson that I'd already learned from the Army. Mm -hmm. I knew that this was something I had to get through, right? And there was some really good instruction in the academy, and there was also some stuff that was not so good. You know, it just, it depended. But that wasn't, that wasn't the challenge for me. The challenge for me, and this was another lesson I learned, this is the lesson I learned from the police department, is when I came into Chicago, I had this mindset of proving myself by being the high performer, right? Because that's what, that's what I'd done in the military my whole time. And in the beginning of my career there, I probably rustled some feathers by being a little bit too much of like a hard charger and trying to, I was trying to do a good job, but I didn't really understand the culture of the department yet. And then when I made that realization, that's also helped me out a lot in life since, like it really has. It um, just, and it was a lesson that I really should have learned from my SF days. It's a big part of special forces is building rapport with the local troops, right? The people that you're going in to train and lead and work with. But I wasn't looking at the police department that way. I was looking at it more like I was coming into, you know, battalion again as a private and I had to like prove myself, right? When I should have looked at it is I have to build rapport with the locals. And once I made that switch, once I flipped that switch in my head, things went a lot better for me. And I didn't, I didn't unintentionally upset people the same way, if that makes sense. And that was a big lesson about learning to get along in an organization that maybe doesn't quite have the same overall drive that you have as an individual. Now, I, I've spoken to some previous Chicago cops. Uh, I don't know if you know him, Raul Martinez was yeah. uh, one of them. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm trying not to stereotype Chicago cops, you know, with, you know, being out of shape and that's your FTO and here you are, you know, the, you know, the special forces, Green Beret Rambo, I'm sure they called you that, um, sitting in the car wanting to go out and, you know, bust some crackheads. Uh, was it difficult for you, you know, trying to balance the, the law enforcement culture and the military culture? Because it's very different cultures, very different, especially in Chicago, especially these big city cultures are very different. It is a very different culture and it was challenging at first, but it's one of the things that I think I'd benefited from having the dual career, right? Mm -hmm. it, it gave me kind of, you know, it's funny. I've never thought about it this way, but this is one of the analogies I use when I talk about shooting in my classes, right? I talk about how you have to build like a transmission in your head. So that you have different gears for different kinds of shooting. And I just realized it's kind of the same thing here it enabled me to build this transmission in my head so I could downshift. So I wasn't always revving at red line like NSF and I could downshift and be a little more palatable to people that weren't as driven as I am, I guess. So I think that was a really good lesson to learn. And it, it was challenging at first. I'm not going to lie. Well, cream rises to the top. Obviously you, you started to have a better career. I mean, I, I want to talk to you how 
you got to there, but you eventually made it to the SWAT team. Was that an early on in your career or did, did you have to lead up to that for a while? So early on, I was in the special operations section, which was like the predecessor to that. Um, it wasn't really a SWAT team at the time. They called it the HBT. It was kind of a different animal. And I wound up coming back and going to SWAT as a sergeant later on. So it was kind of, kind of both. But like I said, it wasn't really, it wasn't really a true SWAT team at the time. And I, I want to step back for a second and apologize to any Chicago PD who is listening to this show. You have my respect. I love you. I think you guys are going through a hard time right now. Uh, I was just doing the typical Hollywood movie version of what a Chicago cop would be. But I know there's a lot of great cops out there who are working really hard to put up a lot of BS right now. Uh, and HBT, that reminds me of uh, the negotiator because that's what they were calling. Because, you know, I, uh, Samuel Jackson movie, if you haven't seen it, it's with the, you know, creepy guy, uh, Kevin Spacey. But it was a good movie. And uh, you got to love how Hollywood portrays it. But I digress. Uh, let's get back to Matt here and his journey in, in Chicago. So wh what, what uh, you said you went there as a sergeant, but what did you have in between? What, what type of uh, roles? So as, as a patrolman, I worked in both uh, district level, gang team and plain clothes. I worked in the housing section where I was in plain clothes. Which housing section? Housing West. So Rockwell Gardens, mm -hmm. um, Ogden Courts, all that stuff. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. It was very, it was before they tore the high rises down. Um, it was an interesting time. Learning how to buy dope in the projects was a bit of a challenge for me at first. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was a really good time. And then uh, I worked in our organized crime division. I worked in the academy as a firearms instructor. Made sergeant, um, had to go back to the district for a little bit, went to the 11th district, also on the west side, um, which is arguably the most violent police district in the nation, quite possibly. I think it probably is. A lot of good cops there. And that's something else I want to say, too, is that, like, I mean, when I, when I talk about the difference in culture between CPD and the Army, I'm by no means being negative about the guys I worked with in CPD. I worked with some really, really good cops, like really good. You know, just some amazing officers and detectives and some good supervisors. And I feel really bad for the guys now because it's it's hard for them now. It really is. But uh, so after making sergeant, I went back to organized crime, you know, ran a team as a sergeant, went to the detective bureau. And this was actually kind of cool because the detective bureau had what was called the heavy weapons team which was like SWAT light. So it's for when you don't really want, you don't really need to call the actual SWAT team, but you don't really want to send guys with five shot revolvers either. You know, it's like that in between bit there. And I ran with some other supervisors. I ran the training for those guys. So basically four days a week, I was Barney Miller. And then one day a week, I was working on the range, teaching the detectives tactics and shooting. And then whenever they had something good, I would go out with them. So that was kind of neat. It was kind of fun. And then from there, I went back to SWAT. And that's where I wound, I wound up finishing out there as the training coordinator. That's pretty cool. Uh, and a lot of people don't know what Barney Miller is anymore. But if you can see that on TV land or one of those other channels, I would watch it. Uh, by far, one of the best uh, detective shows. That's kind of really close to what being a detective is like, um, except for some of the crazy things. But even then, you, we do get crazy things all the time. Uh, so when you were in the training division, the training section in Chicago, what was your training philosophy back then compared to what it is right now? Because I know a lot of stuff now has probably been influenced with competition and some of the world-class instructors that you've got to train with. But back then, what was your style uh, of, of teaching? So style is in terms of like the technique choices for shooting or in terms of like instructional style? Like I, would in terms say, of the I would say a little of both because I, in research for this, since I, I haven't trained with you or I haven't, haven't shot with you, I, I've watched some of your videos and I see what you're presenting. And then of course, what you wrote in your book. Uh, 
but I've also trained with people early on in my career who had a more militaristic style of teaching, you know, very confrontational, not, you know, less coaching, more yelling, more hitting you if you do something wrong in the back of the head, uh, you know, don't do this for whatever made up reason that they can come up with uh, and, you know, never demonstrating a technique, always just telling you how to do a technique. So I'm just curious, you know, with your background in the military, uh, but at a higher level, how is your training uh, in uh, affecting the, the recruits and the officers? I would say as far as like, you know, instructional style goes, that really probably hasn't changed that much. I would just like to think I'm a lot better at it now after so many years of doing it. But I was never really the drill sergeant style instructor. Um, and I think that comes from the time in SF because it is very different there than the rest of the military. You know, and it's when you have when you deal with someone in a large institutional setting and you have a limited amount of time to take them from civilian to a functioning soldier, there is a certain amount of discipline that's necessary to just kind of rewire how they do things. Right. And that that matters and it's important. And that's important in the police academy too. But the one place they don't really yell at you, at least they didn't when I went through at Binning, was when you're on the firing line, right? Like there, they're trying to get you to actually learn it. It probably has to do with the fact that all these privates have loaded guns too, but that's a different story. <laughs> but, uh, and that was always kind of my approach with what people call hard skills, right? Is that you learn skills best when you're allowed to really focus on them and really develop properly and you have good mentorship and good coaching cues and all of that, then learning to apply them is the time you want to add in that stress, you know, and you want to put that stuff in there. But yeah, I was always more of like the, the coaching style, really. I mean, even when I taught martial arts as a teenager, that was more my style. I wasn't the guy, you know, yelling out that, uh, what defeat is not a word we use in this dojo or whatever they say in Cobra Kai, whatever that stuff is on Netflix. You know, I was always more into kind of, I really wanted people to learn, right? And I knew how I learned best. And I, I kind of wanted to adopt more of a, a true coaching mentality with it. And these aren't thoughts that I think I could have articulated as well back then as I can now, because I've had a lot of time to think about them, especially starting up my business. But I don't think my overall viewpoint on it has changed. I just think that I've gotten much more well-versed in it as time goes by. Um, and as far as like shooting technique goes, so when I was at Bragg and I was in the Q course, right? And you have, there's a huge portion of the Q course where you have weekends off because it's like the academic portion, right? So you're, you're there Monday through Friday, but unless you're in the field, it's like being a regular soldier. You're not there 24 seven. So like I bought all the Lenny McGill VHS tapes they used to have, how to shoot fast and accurately. I had a 1911 that was, it was nothing special, but I had one of my buddies that was in the Bravo course go through it with me and we gunsmithed it so I could shoot with it. And I didn't compete then. And, and I'll be honest, I still had kind of a bit of the whole competitor slash gamer versus martial artist slash fighter dichotomy fighting for itself in my head, right? But I couldn't argue with the fact that these guys could shoot when I saw them on video. So I tried as best I could to train kind of like that on my own. And there was a lot I didn't know at the time. There's a lot I know now that I wish I'd known then. And I wish I'd actually competed then. But like I, I had the whole, you know, the burner series by Barnhart and VHS when I was in the police academy. <laughs> Right. And I was like watching those. I actually copied them from don't rat me out to Jerry Barnhart, but I, I black market copied them from one of the other firearms instructors <laughs> and like devoured them. Right. Trying to figure out how to train like that. And I think that that kind of made me more open to the benefits of competition shooting. So when I finally did start competing, I, I just kind of dove in. And I, I knew that was something I really wanted to do. And I knew it was something that would help me. You know, in your book, you, you say, you start off with talking about you had decades of bad habits. So I'm curious, what, what were those bad habits that, that you're referring to? Oh, the press out draw, tension in my shoulders, locking the elbows. <laughs> All the stuff we were taught when I was a young man that really isn't the best way to do it. 
pinning the trigger um, to the rear? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I had that. I had all that stuff. Um, and I had worked a lot of that, a lot of the worst parts of it out before competition, but the part that really was my demon when I started doing competition was the tension, right? Because I could be really tense and still shoot at a really high level compared to my peers in the army or the police department. But then I would go to a USPSA match and it just wasn't, it wasn't working out. That tension was killing me. So that was the big one that I had to struggle with. So your book is the way is in training and I'm guessing the way part is the dough from whenever Japanese martial art that you've done, uh, which martial arts did you do? So when I was young, there was no UFC, right? So I did, uh, I did karate and it was pretty rough and tumble back then. It wasn't a kid's thing back then. And I figured out that wasn't well-rounded enough. So I did Aikido and Judo too. And I couldn't find anything else in the places I was living at the time. We bounced around a lot because I was, my dad was in the service, but I devoured everything I could find on like Jeet Kune Do and Filipino martial arts and all that. And like worked on that kind of on my own until I could find later on in life, I found people to train with and that stuff too. But at the time that was all like just kind of self-study. Right. But the title for the book is actually a quote from Miyamoto Masashi from, uh, it's not from the book of five rings. It's from, it's called the Dakota. It's like his little rules for life. And there's 12 of them. And one of them just reads the way is in training. And that kind of encapsulated for me what I think is the biggest lesson. If I could teach a young soldier or young policeman that one thing, that's going to stand them in good stead. Because a lot of people, I think, look at it kind of backwards. They look at it as the job is what you do when the bad thing happens, right? And that is the most important function of what you're doing as a cop or a soldier. But you're useless in that moment if you don't realize that it's really about you're spending your whole life preparing for a moment that may never come. So you're embracing that process and you find out that there's 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 joy in that. There's joy and pleasure in kind of that self-perfection process. You know, and yes, you want to be tested at some point. If you didn't, you wouldn't have taken that job. But really, the heart of the job is about the preparation, is about the process of training, that process of always sharpening, always trying to get better. And I think that there's a huge lesson in that, not just for a soldier or a policeman or a competition shooter, but for anybody. Because if that's how you look at what you're doing, like you're calling, then you're really never going to be dissatisfied with it because, well, you might be dissatisfied with your skill level. That's a whole different issue. But you're never going to be dissatisfied with living that process because that process itself becomes kind of the goal. It's um, the Stoics put it a different way. They say that, you know, the journey is the destination, right? And Stoicism is just Greek Zen. It's all pretty much the same stuff. But it's like that is such an important thing, I think, for people, because when you can do that, like that takes away all the frustration with not all of it, but that takes away you taking it to heart, taking the frustrations of the bureaucracy, the politicians, you know, the way the war is being run, the way the city's being run, like all that stuff. Yes, those things are frustrating, but if you realize that those aren't really in your control, what is in your control is being the best you can be at what you've chosen to do with yourself. And there's, there's contentment in that, even in the midst of bureaucratic nonsense. You're, are you a big reader? I am. I could tell. Have. Yeah, I think we have some of the same books. I was looking at your bookshelf before we went live. <laughs> uh, that's not too creepy. Um, at least I have good books out there. Uh, you, you were the first soldier, competitor, policeman, author that, when I was reading the book, actually had a quote from J.R.R. Martin and I thought that was great. Uh, that's why that clued me in. Like, uh, he's got, I mean, yeah, everyone can throw in a Bruce Lee coat, quote. Everyone can throw in, you know, some other uh, military, George Patton, whatever. 
But to throw in uh, the guy that did Game of Thrones, um, I, I give you kudos to that. I take Thanks. it you like that show. I do. I do. I like the books even more. I haven't had time to even touch the books, unfortunately. Oh, I, yeah. It, it's the show like, remember the old skit? Here's another one that will date our, our ages, right? But remember uh, Spinal Tap? Sure. The to 11? Well, the books are like the TV show, but turned up to 11. Very cool. Um, all right. So let's talk a little bit more about this book that I think, uh, I don't think there's a more, and I'm not just saying this because you're my guest, but I don't think there's a more complete book out there on every aspect of um, not just training, but just practice and philosophy and CQB. And I mean, this is a manifesto. Is, is that what you set out to do when you put this together? Is like, I'm going to take my 20, 30 years of the journey that I have and, and put it into one book. So if someone picked it up, this is, this is me. It, it was kind of, um, and I wasn't really thinking of it in terms of maybe I was framing it a bit differently, but it was more like I, I wanted to put everything. I wish I could go back in time and tell my 18 year old private self that they should be thinking about. And, you know, obviously there's too many topics to have like a, a true, you know, um, prescription for training each in great detail, but I wanted to at least give like guideposts and starting points and the things to think about. I'm also a big believer that the principles of tactics and technique are universal, but we all have to find our own way to utilize those principles that's optimized for us. So I wanted to kind of give people more of an intellectual exercise. Like here's what I need to be thinking about when I train these things. Here's what I need to be aware of when I plan out my training or when I think about this particular part of my job or this particular skill set. Or even in a lot of cases, it's how, so say I'm not a cop or a soldier, right? But there's lessons to be learned from the things a military or law enforcement person has to do to be good at their job that I think apply to everyone. And I think this is kind of another universal truth, right? That the reason why the lessons can be so valuable for everyone else from our professions is because so much is on the line. You know, people's lives are at stake, not just our own, our friends, people we don't know who could be victimized. Whole countries, futures could be determined by, you know, somebody in the military, right? So because the stakes are so high, the lessons are really clear and concise and telling across other people's lives. So like there's, you know, the stuff in there where I talked about infiltration and exfiltration or breaching, right? And that's not going to apply to everyone, even in law enforcement or the military, but the lessons that you can take from the principles of those tasks can be applied to pretty much everyone's life if you think about it the right way. So that was kind of my thought behind a lot of that stuff. So, so what made you write the book now? Um, a couple different things. Um, one was that, you know, I retired and I, I do have my business, but I have a little more time on my hands than working 68 hours a week as a SWAT guy, right? That was part of it. And one of the reasons that I was able to finish it, apart from all the help from my wife, who was a saint throughout the whole thing, because it took a lot of my time. Mm -hmm. But one of the reasons I was able to finish it was that I had, um, I had multiple surgeries kind of dealing with some things from my careers, you know? So I, I spent a lot of time in hospital beds and on my couch over the last couple of years. So I, I tried to use that time to do something valuable rather than just sitting there and, and binge watching Forged on Fire on, on the History Channel. So that was, that was part of it. Um, a big part of it was also that when I started teaching, so I, I want to say this the right way, because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to act like I know everything or I've learned all the lessons or I don't make mistakes. It's not that at all. But I do feel like I have had kind of a unique dual career. And then when you add in the competition and the martial arts from my youth, it kind of, it all factors together, right? And I think it gives me kind of a unique perspective. And I hope at least that people find that valuable and that it's worth sharing with people. 
And that was kind of my hope. This book, like I said, it covers so many things. And you talk about your injuries in the book. And uh, you, you had hip surgery. And you got a bone infection. Or was it, was it the implant that was infected? Or was it, did it actually get in your bone? Um, so what they think happened is that there was like an encapsulated pocket of blood from the surgery. And that when I started getting being able to move again, I wound up popping that. And that it had, you know, it had gotten bacteria in there while it was encapsulated. Um, it actually went septic. It, uh, I, I'm such, <laughs> this, this is me in a nutshell, right? I was uh, actually teaching out of state when it popped and I, I felt something pop and like my whole leg went black and blue. And I called up Angela, my wife, and I'm like, hey, you know, I think I might have pulled something, but I can still walk on it. So the implant isn't dislocated. So I think I'm fine. And I came home and she's like, your whole leg is like chartreuse and yellow and black and purple. Like you need to go to the doctor. I'm like, no, nah, I'll just walk it off. I'm fine. And we actually went to shoot a match. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and like, I'm actually septic and don't even know it, right? I've got sepsis and don't even realize it. At about four stages of the match, I'm like, I, I need to go sit down. <laughs> and I, once again, this, this just shows, I, I'm laughing at myself with this because I still didn't want to go to the emergency room. So finally, the next day, I'm like, I think I need to go to the emergency room. And we go to the ER and they're like, yeah, we're going to admit you and you need to get that redone. <laughs> wow. You're very lucky. Yeah, no, it's... <sighs> I started realizing it was a big deal when they told me they were going to put a catheter behind my heart so they could see if there was any heart valve damage. I was like, okay, so maybe this is kind of serious, but it all worked out okay. Good. And the next implant was fine? No infection? No infection. Um, I've been doing a lot of uh, strength and conditioning work, actually, and the movement started. I'm, I'm moving better than I have in years, and I'm getting back into really good shape again. It, it's going great. And I'm really happy with it. So it was a rough road, but it all worked out in the end. Good. Good for you. Um, so getting back to the book again, you had mentioned earlier, a couple of bad habits and you, you threw out there the press out. Now was, the, I know we, you, you talk about as one of your drills, Todd Green's fast drill, but he was a big proponent of the press out. So I'm, is that the same press out that you're saying you, you don't care for too much? the fights up and pushing up. Yeah. So, so here's my opinion on the press out, right? I think that if you're teaching police recruits or soldiers who may not dry fire much, but are going to be carrying a pistol, I don't necessarily think that's a bad technique for them because it allows them to do two tasks at once. They're cleaning up the sites and presenting the pistol. But once you develop an index, as I'm sure you'd agree with me, then it becomes kind of superfluous. You're wasting time. If you can just bring the gun up to where it's aligned and the sights are properly aligned, why waste the time? But that requires more repetition and more practice. So I understand that in an institutional setting, when you're dealing with people who are not going to pursue excellence, there are certain things you have to compromise to give them effective techniques because they have to be able to, to use them in short order. But I think that if you're going to spend a lifetime trying to be good at this stuff, then techniques like that are probably going to become limiting factors very shortly. I'm glad you brought that up because you're, you're an instructor, you're out there, you're, your company's gray, Graybeard Actual, uh, and we'll get to the name in a second. But you've trained law enforcement. Now, did you train all law enforcement or were you specifically doing your SWAT guys? So on the police department, I did both. I did uh, recruit firearms training early on in my career. And then I ran the training for the SWAT team for my last several years. Okay. The department. So in dealing with law enforcement, uh, there's an interesting uh, phenomenon, but a lot of cops don't like their guns. They don't like to use their guns. They don't like to practice with their guns. Versus the people who are in, you know, specialized units or on SWAT, they tend to get more training. And in return, they're also out there shooting more and practicing more and pushing themselves more. So even like the guys that are teaching private classes now, 
and they're doing like law enforcement private classes to say, teach them a red dot site or whatever. Again, you're getting the higher end people who are motivated to, to get the red dots, whatever, but it's the lower level entry level law enforcement officers that don't really want it. So how do you motivate them to be better at, at practicing and at shooting? So this is, I want to be a little careful about how I talk about this because I'm going to talk about the academy when I work there, right? And some of the people that I have a difference of opinion with are people that I like as individuals. So I, I don't want to slam anybody too hard, but there was a whole generation of cops in Chicago that in my opinion were turned off to practicing shooting because of the way the firearms instruction was done. Um, it was very much the style you were talking about, where there's a lot of yelling, a lot of, you know, just not a lot of coaching going on, a lot of being told what to do, right? And not being really shown how to do it necessarily. And I think that was also one of the reasons why I adopted a very different style when I worked at the academy was because if you take someone who's never done a task that to many people feels a bit unnatural, right? To a lot of people, that little explosion going off in front of your face can be unnatural, right? It, it really can. And you put them in that and then you create this expectation in their heads that they should already be good at this somehow without having to work on it. And the fact that they're having to work on it is somehow a failure on their part. Like you make it to where people don't want to do this activity. They don't want to get yelled at for something they don't know how to do. Am I, am I making sense there? Like that's, that's something that I think really matters. And I think that's important. I think that you need to, you need to do kind of two things. You need to both show them that it's a task that shouldn't be intimidating, right? And you need to also kind of impress upon them the fact that they need to be good at this. Like, you know, here's a good example from Chicago. It's the video that's going viral right now all over social media of the off-duty female police officer that got mugged on the South Side. With a gun, correct? Yep, 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 yep. And like, she wasn't even at work, right? Like you need to impress upon people that this is a skill you need to be good at because you are going to be carrying a gun and it is part of your job. And I know that this is like really unpopular with police brass a lot to talk about this sort of thing, but part of your job is gunfighter. Like that is part of your job. People don't like using that word, but you are carrying a gun for the express purpose of using it to defend others or to apprehend people who may harm others. Like that's an important thing that should be taken very seriously. And you should try to be good at it if you're going to give yourself that responsibility. Because if the moment comes and you're found wanting, really bad things can happen, right? Like really bad things can happen to you, to other people, and you've got to have that skill level. But it shouldn't be something that's intimidating because the process can be enjoyable, it can be fun. Like I talked about earlier, that process of improving yourself, it's like any other physical pursuit. If you work on something and you start to get good at it, that's satisfying, right? Like um, think about the first time you pulled off a sub two second bill drill. Like, it, that's satisfying. Like you have the smile on your face, like, yeah, like that was, that was pretty damn cool. And I just did that. Right. And I think if you give people that, that motivation, that will help there. And if that doesn't help them, some people just aren't, some people unfortunately don't take it seriously enough, I think. And sometimes there is no answer for motivating them. Fair enough. Uh, I think one of the detrimental factors, and I agree with you when I read this, in your book is that people justify certain skill sets based off of FBI data, right? Uh, just go a little bit into that because I found that very interesting. So, and I do think it is true that the average, you know, off-duty cop or civilian gunfight probably is around three to five yards, three to five seconds, three to five shots. Like that, that is the, the biggest part of the bell curve. But the danger in a lot of the statistics, especially from the FBI, is because they're collected about officer fatalities, not gunfights. So it doesn't give you a complete picture of what's actually going on. 
And the other thing is that, so if you use that to justify your training and that's all you focus on, like I know how my luck goes. My luck is such that if I train for the five yard gunfight and that's all I do, I'm going to have the 25 yard engagement with a guy with a rifle and that's going to be what I'm stuck with. Right? So you need to give yourself enough skill to handle those outliers. And the other thing I think that is vitally important that people don't really take into account is that like, here's an example from the competition world. In my experience, at least I'm never going to perform as well on any particular task I do within a field course, you know, a bigger stage at a match for those listening that don't compete as I do in that skill in isolation. Right? So if I'm working like, you know, one or two shot draws, I can burn out a pretty fast draw, but my draw in a field course is not going to be as fast as it was in isolation because you're layering all these tasks and you have the additional stress of it being a competition. Well, it's the same thing for this, right? So if you want a certain amount of skill, you need to have a buffer built in when you're training. You need to have skill above and beyond that when you're training. And people don't, don't really think about it that way as a general rule. They're like, well, I need to be able to do this, so I'll do this. If I need to be able to do that when it really counts and I might be nervous, hungover, surprised, injured, I need to have about 20% above that, right? Um, I mean, you, you have some guests on here that are just phenomenal shooters, like people I'm in awe of, you know? And they say all the time, like all the top guys I train with say all the time that they don't shoot 100% in matches. They shoot about 85, 90% of what they can do in isolation. And that's gonna be the same for you in a gunfight. Like you need to have that extra buffer built in so that you can shoot at your, it's not a lazy pace, it's not being complacent, but it's a pace, a pace where you're not going to make mistakes. Because I would be willing to bet that almost every fight ever fought since the dawn of time was lost by the guy that made more mistakes than the other guy. You know, I would agree with it, that. Yeah. And it's look at matches. It's the same way. Like, you know, all the top guys shoot about the same. Who wins nationals is based on who made more mistakes. Very true. Um, so your classes, so Greybeard Actual, what, what is, I, I know actual is a military term where that's the actual person who's talking, so they know that. But uh, why Greybeard Actual? What was it referencing? So it, this is actually a war story. Um, if we have time, I'll tell it real quick. I'll tell like an abbreviated version of it, right? So my team in 20th group was probably the oldest team chronologically, you know, the age of the members, probably in the entire SF regiment by my last trip over. And my beard wasn't gray yet. I was still ginger, but I was like either the oldest of the young guys or the youngest of the old guys, depending on how you wanted to look at it. I was like the guy in between the really older guys and the new kids. And remember over there in Afghanistan, life expectancy is short, right? And by the time you're 40 over there, you tend to look like you're 65 or 70 here, you know? So the fact that we had gray beards, most of us, like the Taliban really kind of, they're like in awe of that, like it's seen as a sign of wisdom, right? And I guess we kind of had a rep among the local Taliban. We got in a big fight one time and we fought for an extended period of time. And finally we, we like made our way across the village and we're going to get picked up by the helicopters, right? So we go to the LZ and myself and another American, Dave, good friend of mine, we take two squads of Afghans out to secure the PZ for the birds because it's on like a little hilltop right outside the village. So it's very exposed. So we've got a perimeter set in and my interpreter comes running up because they listen to all the communications from the Taliban because it's not encrypted, right? This is on walkie talkies. So he comes running up and he goes, Commander Matt, um, the Taliban say they get their guns and get revenge for their fallen brothers we killed. They're coming to fight us. I'm like, all right, we're settling in for a fight. So I get on the radio and I call the rest of the team and I tell them, you know, you're standby. I think we're going to get hit again. Figuring that we would get hit and they would flank them and fix them and take them out. And then we bring the birds in. So the birds are race tracking and waiting. And we're waiting for them to attack. And we're waiting. And we're waiting. And I'm like, God damn it. They're late for their own fight. Like, this is ridiculous. 
you know, and we've been up for a couple days and I'm, I'm getting kind of cranky. I just want to get this over with, you know. And Ali comes like kind of stepping up to me sideways with this look on his face. So he knows like, he knows I'm going to be upset, right? He's like sliding up to me sideways and he goes, Commander Matt, um, I'm so sorry. Uh, the Taliban say it is the graybeards. Go home and hide your guns. No one else dies today. I was like, what? <laughs> So I guess we had a street name. Like, you know how they give cops street names? I guess we had a street name. We were the Greybeards. So the reason why I took that as the name of my training company was kind of to pay a little bit of homage to the guys that taught me and kept me alive. Because the guys that were older than me on the team, they mentored me and taught me and made me competent enough to survive the war and kept me alive. So now what I would like to do, now that I'm retired and my beard's gray, is I want to do the same thing for the next generation as much as I can. I want to give them any lessons I can give that I learned the hard way to make it easier for them to get good at their craft. So that's where the name comes from. And what kind of uh, training are you doing right now? So I do some stuff with departments. You know, I do like tactics and, and firearms with different departments. And I've got open enrollment classes as well. Um, I do like basically two two styles of classes. I do like performance shooting classes and I do like application stuff where it's either, you know, fighting around vehicles or lessons I've learned from like, you know, gunfights that I've been in that I think would be helpful to like CCW holders, right? Or off duty cops, things like that. Um, I'm doing a, uh, a fighting inside structures class for civilians this year that I'm pretty excited about that's not CQB, right? So like everybody loves the phrase CQB, but CQB is something you do as a team when you're assaulting a building. This class is more about how to fight inside a building if you find yourself in that situation. So it's still applicable to law enforcement, but it also applies to civilians as well, right? And I've got one, I do a lot through TTPOA since I'm in Texas, through like the SWAT organization here. And I do stuff through OTOA as well. But I've got one through TTPOA coming up in just a few weeks that I'm really pretty excited about because when my guys come through my performance shooting classes that I do for TTPOA, I'm always talking about the benefits of competition, right? And a lot of people kind of like the idea, but it's kind of, it is kind of hard as a cop to go to your first shooting match, right? And kind of lay it all, lay it all out on the line. So I've got a class that I'm doing up in the Dallas Fort Worth area. That's an intro to competition for the tactical shooter. So it's basically what you can get from competition, but how to go to your first match and understand the rule set and be ready to, to not, you know, not be struggling so much learning the game and knowing what you can get from the game that'll help you at your work. So that's one that I'm pretty excited about. Did you ever uh, train with Craig Douglas? I know Craig. Um, I've never managed to get into ECQC, but I'm a big fan of his work. Um, I've, I first started like seeing Craig on the internet, I think in the old forums, like 15 years ago, talking right. about stuff. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's actually how I met Todd Green was at a uh, Craig Douglas class. And the reason I'm thinking about it is because it, it was, it was called armed movement in structures. That was okay. his, CQB class, but you know how Craig is. He always talks in these really weird metaphors of stuff. So yeah, armed movement and structures. So I, I took that class and this is a little side note. So in that class, it's, it's basically, you know, it's an open enrollment class. And so it's, it's one man building clearing, you know, you come home, you went out to get the milk and you come home, the doors open, your family's inside. Right? Are, are you going to sit there and wait for the police? Or are you going in? Right? Most people are going in, especially if you're carrying a gun. So it was a really interesting class. Uh, but the grand finale of the class is you had to, and it was done in Culpeper, Virginia, in this warehouse, this four story warehouse that is closed. But it was just every horror show that you could possibly think of with like grotesque looking broken dummies and glass on the floor. I mean, it was just, it was horrible and there was no lights. So you had to go through this with only your flashlight. And there was two uh, SF guys in the class. So it was like, you know, a couple of law enforcement SF guys and then uh, some civilians. And these two guys ran the, the grand finale without using their lights at all. 
It was so impressive. There's the four bad guys inside, and they ran the whole thing, you know, individually, but just using their their guns, night sights, and whatever skill set that they've developed in in you know the military. Uh, it was kudos to you guys. Um, so okay, so you you have these classes going on uh, in open enrollment. Uh, where can people find you? So we've got uh, the website is graybeardactual.com, and I. I got both URLs, so it's got G R E Y and G R A Y because they're both correct. <laughs> but I figured, I figured I'd buy both, so you'd wind up at my website either way. Um, Graybeard underscore actual on Instagram and Graybeard actual on Facebook. Um, I'm on Twitter now too. Now that it's free speech, so it's Graybeard underscore actual on Twitter. And yeah, that's that's the best way to find it. The class schedules are up on the website. I've got a calendar there with, and I've got links to external classes too. So like anything through a SWAT organization is on the calendar and it's linked through there so they can register for that. And of course, I'll be at like, I'll be at the TTPOA conference and the OTOA conference as well. And if anybody, you know, wants to bring me out for a class, my email address, it's actually, I should rephrase this. My wife, thank God, has a much better head for business than I do. So she handles all the scheduling. So if you email info at Graybeard Actual, which is the contact on the website, you'll actually get her, not me. But that's a good thing because she'll actually schedule it right. Uh, so before we uh, uh, finish up, I just want to know if, if there's anybody who's been listening to this and you have a question for, for Matt, now would be the time uh, before I uh, uh, thank Matt for his time and everything he's done tonight. Um, it's, you know, where, where can people buy that book, by the way? It's on amazon.com and it's also on Barnes and Noble. The ebook version is both on Amazon and you can get it on iTunes as well. And a bunch of people asked me for an audiobook version. So that's actually been recorded, not by me, by somebody with a better voice than me. And that's in the process of review. So once that's reviewed and published, it'll be available on iTunes, Amazon, and Audible. So. Well, no one, it's kind of late, so no one is asking any questions, and that's fine. Uh, thank you, Larry. Uh, Larry Damore, saying it's a great interview. Uh, he's a great guest to have on. I could go on and on. I don't want to push too far past the hour time. Um, but yeah, I mean, just like your book, there's so much to dive into in that book. I, here we go. All right. Here's a question from uh, Rogue Acosta. I'm pretty sure I've, I've seen him uh, on Instagram. So uh, he's asking, what is your favorite live fire drill to hit every session with and why? Doubles. Ben Steger's doubles. Because it just, it's such a simple drill, but it affects your performance on everything else you do, especially with a pistol. Just the, the grip, the recoil management, tracking the sights and recoil, learning to see all of that stuff. So, and uh, that's, that's Alex Acosta. He's a really good local GM shooter here. He's, he's solid. He's a good dude too. Yeah. I, 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 I like I said, I've seen his, uh, I think I follow him on Instagram. Uh, I've seen him running around squirting bullets um thanks for uh watching the show uh you said it was alex alex yeah, yeah alex thanks for watching the the show alex um yeah the i love the doubles drill also i think uh, uh you learn so much about what you can and cannot do and then it's got to be able to apply it uh <laughs> without getting in the way of it when you're shooting that match uh, that's been my thing um Competition wise, do you have? I see you're shooting the uh, PCC. Is that is that where your focus is these days? So, I think this year for majors, I'm going to do PCC for USPSA, and I'm going to do carry optics for IDPA. Um, I shoot a lot of a lot of locals in open as well for USPSA. I'm really, I know I'm in the minority here but I'm really kind of holding out for limited optics for USPSA because I'll be able to shoot the guns I like. So, and I, be I know, 
I've had some people on, on everyone so far has been positive about it. I, I know on the internet you can find the negative. I, I don't think it's a negative. I think the more people we can get shooting, the better. And if that's your limiting factor, the fact that you, you want to shoot a limited gun with a dot on it, then by all means go and shoot it. Um, can we get rid of some divisions? That's a different story. But uh, I wouldn't get rid. I don't want to go to a whole podcast on what we should get rid of and get rid. Of. That's that's for some other shows. Uh, but yeah, I think limited options would be a cool thing. Uh, but like I keep telling people, I'm I'm going to be shooting irons again. I'm going back to production. Uh, I it's going to be the way the dodo bird at some point. I just want to remember how to shoot them. Uh, I like it. I've always enjoyed it. Uh, dot. I just think it's it's fun. But uh, I think it's just, it's becoming the race thing. You know, everyone is just pushing the limits with the dots and I'm going to stick with production for now. Just like Eric. One day I'll be Eric. <laughs> there's, Not there's Eric, but Eric. <laughs> there's definitely kind of a, a purity to the iron sights, I guess. But I just like, I was an early adopter of the dot and I'll tell you mm -hmm. why. I was around for the arguments about dots on rifles. I remember that. And I remembered how that wound up shaking out. So I was pretty soon, I was pretty sure, you know, early on when they started making optics you could actually use on a gun you carried. I, I was pretty sure I knew how it was going to shake out and I wanted to go ahead and hop on. And now that I've done it, I just, you know what I really love about it as far as like a, a training aspect? It's not even just the performance aspect. It's, you can see so much more of what the dot is doing when you're shooting that I think you can learn faster. You know, you can you can pick up the things you're doing wrong easier and work on correcting them, I think. No, I think it's definitely easier to teach my kid how to shoot a dot than it is to try and get behind him and understand, you know, this is how you want to line up the sights and this is what you want to be seeing and don't be focusing too hard on it because the more you focus on it, you're missing the other stuff. And it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot harder. It's easier to just say, hey, put the dot where you want it. <laughs> for the and that you know they're used to doing that my god with i don't know if you have kids but with the games yeah. that they play today uh the computer games he's like oh so is that a, a 320 or is that a 1911 or that because you know that's what they're seeing all the time uh but i i agree with you i think it's it's fun to shoot the dot um uh, i know there's some people here who uh, are saying that they uh they're still shooting iron so uh good job uh so all right uh you know, I definitely like to talk to you again uh, sometime soon, and um, because there's there's more to flesh out. Like I said, I don't want to go too far past the hour. So, thank you very much for coming on the Firearms Nation podcast and sharing some of your insights. Uh, guys, go out get this book. Um, I'll link it down below. Uh, take a class with him. But I mean, like I'm telling you, the book covers everything from grappling to shooting to to like you said, CQB to breaching. Uh, it is the kitchen sink of tactics and shooting and, and the martial way. So uh, thank you very much, Matt, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it, and I appreciate it. And thank you all for uh, tuning in tonight. And like I said, please subscribe so you'll see when I am doing the next show and with whom. So thank you all. Everyone be safe and take care.